So anyway, we are in 1 Samuel tonight, 1 Samuel, and we will look, we're going to look at chapter 20 tonight of 1 Samuel, but we want to start in verse chapter 18. There are, uh, I, I know we've looked at a lot of things from chapter 18, but I want to look at uh, this tonight about David and Jonathan. In verse 1, and it came to pass when he made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as he loved his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David, and his garments, even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his girdle. Father, we thank you again tonight for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the reading of it. And Lord, we pray tonight that you will bless and encourage us in the few minutes that we have. Lord, as we think about Jonathan and David, Lord, I, I, I pray, that, Lord, that you will help us Lord, tonight, encourage us, I pray. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. If I were to ask you tonight, if I were to say to you, what is your definition of a friend? My definition is somebody who knows you and still likes you anyway. See, that, that's, you know, that's a friend. They, uh, they know all about you. And they still like you anyway, despite all of your failures and despite all your faults. A friend. Uh, the Bible says that a, a friend loveth at all times. A friend loves at all times. If you're going to have friends, you've got to be friendly. Um, if you're not going to be friendly, people say, well, I, I, I never have any friends. Well, how friendly are you? Well, if you're not very friendly, you're not going to have many friends. A person must show himself friendly to have friends. I hope you remember this. I said this a while back about Jonathan and David, that Jonathan was probably 20 to 25 years older than David. We, when we read about Jonathan and David, we often think that David and Jonathan were the same age, but they weren't. Jonathan was much older than David. One of the reasons that we know this is that, that Jonathan had a son that was like five or, I forget how old Mephibosheth was. He may have been 10 years old. But David and Jonathan were not the same age. But they were, they were, they were more than just friends. In our reading tonight, it says that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. I suppose that that was true of David to Jonathan. We don't read a whole lot about their encounters together. Suffice it to say that Jonathan loved David and would do anything for David. He would do anything for David. Look in 1 Samuel, just over a couple of pages, in chapter 20. We're going to look at that. But look at verse 30. It says, Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion, and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. But Jonathan was willing to do anything for David. When we read in chapter 18, when David took off the robe, you'll remember in, in was it Luke chapter 6, uh, wasn't chapter 16, Luke chapter 15. 
Remember when the prodigal son came home and the father stood a great way off and when he saw his son, he ran to him. And he, when he saw him, he said, bring forth the best robe. And I believe that, you know, that robe was not just what time is it time to get up? Let's put on a bathrobe robe. That robe was the best robe. That was the best that he had. And I think that when Jonathan took his, the robe and gave David a robe, it wasn't something that he had laying around, but it was something that was special. He gave him his, he subjected himself to him by saying, you know, here's my armor, here's my sword, here's my bow. I am, I am your friend. Whatever may come, I am your friend. And Saul, his father, as we noted, was a maniac of many different kinds. He was a homicidal maniac. He wanted to kill David. He wanted to kill his own son. I mean, can you imagine that? He wanted to kill his own son. And a few chapters after chapter 20, we find that Doeg told Saul that Abathar had told, given David something to eat and given him the Saul of, of, of Goliath, or given him the sword of Goliath, and Saul had him come and all of his family. And, and that day the high priest was killed, or the priest was killed, and all his family was killed. And then they went over to the city where they were from and killed the women and the children and didn't spare anything because Saul was a Saul's a maniac, of, which we simply can't describe how bad he was. I mean, the son of Sam pales in comparison to Saul. But Jonathan loved David. In chapter 20, we read of the last encounter that we know of between Jonathan and David. Now, how much time passes between chapter 20 and chapter 18, chapter 14? How much time goes by? No one can say for sure. And let me say this. I'm not doubting the Word of God. I do not doubt the Word. I never doubt the Word of God. Uh, some have suggested that chapter 17, when David killed Goliath, was put in between chapter 16 and 18, that it was not really in, in consecutive order. Well, whether it was or not, it's immaterial. But how much time passes between the killing of Goliath when David comes in, Jonathan gives him his robe and his sword and his, and his uh, bow, and chapter 21, or chapter 20, it, it's not really clear. But some time probably has passed. Now, it tells us in chapter 19, we're not going to look at chapter 19, but David fled... How did David get away from Saul the first time? Who remembers? How did David get away from Saul? How did he get away from him? Saul wanted to kill him. How did he get away from him? Out the window. Out the window. Who let him out the window? Michael. Michael, his wife. And then she made a dummy of some kind. and We could say a lot about that, but made a dummy of some kind, put it in the bed, and when Saul's men came, and... Then Saul called for Michael to come and said, why did you help him? And she said, well, he said he was going to kill me if I didn't, which he, what he said, she simply said to him that if you don't leave tonight, you're going to be dead by the morning. And so Michael let him down through the window. David escapes, meets up with Samuel in chapter 19, uh, who the book is named after. They, they leave Ramah, where Samuel lives, go to another city, uh, Saul eventually shows up there because he heard that David was there, but David had already fled. And we then come to chapter 20. Jonathan and David now meet up again. And they converse. I don't really want to read the entire chapter, but it says in verse 3, And David swear moreover and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. Now David comes and meets Jonathan and says, Look, your father knows that I'm your friend, and you're my friend, and 
that you would do anything for me, and, and he's not going to tell you what he's going to do. He won't do that, and how are we going to know if your father, and, and Jonathan said, well, Jonathan had said, well, if my father's going to kill you, surely I would know if he's going to kill you. He's my father, and I'm there all the time. David said there is but a step, and that's a good verse when you think about it. There's but a step between, between us and what it says there. I uh, see, there is but a step between me and death. That's true of us every day. There's but a step, but a heartbeat, but a breath between us and death every single day. And that's why, of course, as we are well aware of it, it pays to be ready. So Jonathan and David come up with a plan. They do come up with a plan. And verse 6 Let's read that. And if thy father at all miss me, David is speaking. Then say, David earnestly asked, leave of me, that he might run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he say thus, it is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant to a covenant of the Lord with thee, notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity. David is saying now to Jonathan, if, there, if I have done something, if there is iniquity in me, slay me thyself. He said to Jonathan, if I have done anything, and of course we know no man is, is, is guiltless. Solomon said there is not a just man, there is not a, there is not a just man that doeth good, upon the earth. And while we know David had many faults, David had some glaring weaknesses. And to say, well, and what David says to Jonathan, well, if I've done anything to harm your father, then go ahead and kill me right now. But I haven't done anything. What have I done? Of course, we know that Saul wasn't, wasn't evil, jealous, envious man who was jealous of David from the very beginning he was jealous of David and was trying to kill him now Jonathan says in verse 9 far it be from me for I know certainly that evil was that I mean if for if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon thee then would not I tell it thee. And said David to Jonathan, Who shall tell me, or what, if thy father answer thee roughly? And so they come up with this plan that in three days, Jonathan will come back to where uh, an appointed place was, and he's going to shoot some arrows, he said. And he said, If I shoot them on this side of the rock and say to the I'll have somebody with me. The arrows were over there. Or if I shoot them over in that direction and say the arrows were over there. If I say they're over there, we'll know that there is peace. And that my father does not determine to do any evil upon thee. And if they're over there, then we'll know that my father has determined to kill thee. And so they said, they said, good, we'll do that. We'll do that. Verse 24, so David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat down to eat meat. The king sat upon his seat, as at other times, even upon a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. Now Abner, who was Abner? Not little Abner, but who was Abner? Who was Abner? Anybody know? Okay, forgot, but that's all right. Abner was the um, General Schwarzkopf. President Bush's General Schwarzkopf was, was Saul's Abner. Abner was a man of war. Abner was the captain of, of Saul's army. Abner was Saul's right-hand man. Abner... Left a lot to be desired, but he was a good soldier. 
He was that. Abner was at his right side. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spake not anything that day. For he thought, something hath befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet, neither yesterday nor today? Jonathan answered, Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, Let me go, I pray thee, for our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother, he hath commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brethren. Therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. All right, I have a question. I have a question. Where did David live? What was the city of David? Anybody? What, Bethlehem. That's where he was from. So, and I read it right there anyway, so, you know, I bet anyone else. So then we had read verse 30 and 31. Saul got very angry at Jonathan. And I read this, you know, it's, it's, often, hard, it's often hard to tell the, uh, ages and so forth. But Saul was about probably, probably about 70 uh, when he was killed uh, at the end of this book. So Saul now is in his late 60s. There, there will be a period of time, and we'll see this, when Saul tries repeatedly to kill David. But Saul is somewhat older, and Jonathan is probably about 50 about this time now, and, and if not older. I read one account, and, and trying to figure out dates, it's like somebody said, one, of the, one writer wrote that Saul was like 14 years old when Jonathan was born. And I just found that one a little hard to believe. I, I think that Saul was probably about 20 years older than, than Jonathan, and Jonathan was in his, probably in his 50s now, if not 50, he was older. And Abner's there, Jonathan's there, they're eating, and it's like Saul sits at the table with a loaded gun. The Bible says he's sitting there eating, and the javelin's right in his hand. And when Jonathan, he knew that Jonathan uh, wasn't telling the truth to him, and he picked the spear up, and he threw it at Jonathan. Look at, if you would, and uh, see if I can find this... Uh, uh, I might be able to find it. David spares Saul's life. I'll just tell you, tell you what happened. That Saul, oh, that Saul became very angry. Look at verse eight of chapter twenty-two. Here it is. Saul became very angry again. The Bible warns us about. <clears throat> Bible says, "Be not, be, be not, not to be." A friend of an angry man. Everybody, everybody gets upset. Listen, everybody gets upset. There ain't anybody that doesn't get upset. I mean, it, it, somebody cuts you off driving. Somebody takes the parking spot you were waiting for. Uh, somebody takes the last dress you wanted to get. Uh, somebody does something at work. Uh, your wife looks at you the wrong way. Uh, anything. Any, you know, it could be anything. Uh, you're in school teaching, and the kids give you a hard time. Uh, anything can, can cause us to go off. But Saul was a, was a terribly angry man. Notice in verse 7, Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Hear now, ye Benjaminites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? Now, the guy is paranoid that all of you have conspired against me. Everybody's against me. Nobody's for me. And there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you that is sorry for me. I mean, the guy is paranoid, but 
I mean, he's got a terrible case of self-pity. Oh, nobody feels sorry for me. Well, that's right. Pretty much nobody's ever going to feel sorry for you in this life. I can tell you that. Nobody feels sorry for me. Nobody has told me that my son is in cahoots with David. Nobody had nerve enough to tell me. Everybody's against me. Nobody feels sorry for me. Or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Now, if David did not stir up, I mean, Jonathan did not stir up David to get it Saul. We, we will say this about David, that he was in this particular case. Now, there are other things that he was not, but in this particular case, in, in his relationship with Saul, David was innocent. David, we, we, we know this, that David was going to be the king, but David was innocent in that he was not, David was not trying to take the kingdom from Saul. He had every opportunity to do that. But David did not do that. He repeatedly asked Jonathan, what have I done? I haven't done anything. Yet Saul is so maniacal, he's such a maniac, he thinks everybody, everybody's against me. That's like Joseph Stalin. Stalin, of course, was that butcher of Russia. And... The, the people affectionately called him Uncle Joe. Yet he murdered 15 million of his people. He trusted no one. People who were his closest advisors he had killed because he trusted nobody. Saul is like that. Everybody's against me. Nobody feels sorry for me. My own son is against me. Now, the truth is that God had taken the kingdom from Saul, from Saul, that David was going to be king. Eventually, Saul would die and David would become king. Jonathan was okay with that. Jonathan had no problem with that. He said, he told David, he said, you're going to be king and I'm going to be right there next to you. He said, I understand that God is, God is, going to make you king. I understand that. And I'm okay with that. Saul wasn't. And so Saul tries to kill his own son. Jonathan then knows that evil is determined upon David and that his father is going to do everything he can to kill him. And Jonathan said in verse 32, and Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What has he done? What has David done? He hadn't done anything. He delivered Israel from Goliath. He had not done a thing. Saul cast the javelin in verse 33. So in verse 34, so Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat no meat the second day of the month. He was, he was angry. I I know the Bible says this, fathers provoke not your children to wrath. It's a warning. But Jonathan was highly grieved that his father had thrown the javelin at him. And it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David, a little lad with him. And he said unto his lad, run, find now the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the lad was come to the place of the arrow, which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond thee? And Jonathan cried after the lad, Make speed, haste, stay not. And Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came to his master. But the lad knew not anything. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter. One thing about friends, you can tell friends something and you don't have to worry about it. Jonathan gave his artillery unto his lad and said unto him, Go carry them to the city. 
Now, verse 41 and verse 42, I believe, is the last meeting between Jonathan and David. And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another. And wept with one another. So David exceeded. David said, "That's enough." I mean, he's David. You know, we often read that John, the soul of Jonathan, was knit to David. But and the Bible says that he loved him as Jonathan loved David as he loved his own soul. But I believe that David loved Jonathan too. I believe that they were best buddies. I believe they were best friends. I'm sure Jonathan knew all the faults that David may have, and David, I'm sure, knew all the faults that Jonathan had, but they still loved one another. As they meet in that field for the last time, David bows himself to his friend. And then they rise up and they kiss one another, and then they weep. I'm reminded of the reunion with Esau and Jacob. You remember that day when Jacob is now returning and, and Esau is riding from Mount Seir where he lived and he had 400, I like to call them 400 cowboys with him. They were all riding to meet Jacob and Jacob remembered the words of his brother Esau the last time they met in which Esau said the next time I see you. Actually what he said was, once father is dead I'm going to kill you. And pretty strong words. And Rebecca told Jacob, go to my brother Laban. And so they, Jacob went over there and was there for, I believe, 20 years. I believe it was 20 years. And he was there all that time. And now he's coming home. And he divides up the family. He put the handmaid, Bill, I believe, was one in front with her children, and then the other handmaid with her children. Then he put Leah with her children, and then he put Rachel with uh, Joseph and then Jacob sent all these cattle and all these gifts and all this presents out to Esau and now Esau comes and Jacob bows himself to the ground and Esau says get up the Bible says that they wept and that they kissed one another and Esau said to Jacob, what are all these presents? They said, they're for you. Jacob said, they're for you. And Esau said, I've got enough, brother. He said, I don't need anything. I've got enough. Here we find David and Jonathan on their last meeting. Verse 42, and Jonathan said to David, go in peace. For as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, say, you know what I think was a glad reunion day? I'll bet it was a glad reunion when Jonathan and David met again in heaven. I believe that Jonathan, from what I read about Jonathan, you remember in chapter 14 when he said, uh, hey, let's go out and kill the Philistines, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And so just Jonathan and his armor bearer went up and killed all those Philistines. I believe that Jonathan knew God, feared God, believed in God. The covenant that they made between one another the covenant that Jonathan made with David was, look, as long as I'm alive, we're going to be friends. And he said, when I am dead, he said, I want you to show mercy to my descendants. And David said, no problem with that. And we find in, in 2 Samuel that Jonathan had one son left, whose name was Mephibosheth, who was lame, who lived in a place called Lodabar, and... It was the poor section of town. He really had nothing. All of his lands were gone. Some, David said one day, is there anybody left at the house of Jonathan? And somebody said, well, he's got a son living down in Lodabar. And, and somebody said, well, get the royal chariot and go get him. And of course, usually, when the next king came to power, he killed all the people from the other family and so Mephibosheth had to have thought, well, the end is near. 
And David brought him to his house, restored all his lands, and said, you're going to eat at the king's table from now on. You're going to be as one of the king's sons. You're going to eat at my table from now on. I've, I've said this, I have said this many times. That is a picture of grace. Mephibosheth didn't do anything to deserve that. He didn't, des- he didn't had done nothing. And it, if David had been like every other king, he would have just killed him. But he made a covenant with Jonathan. And in the shaping of the man of God, there's one thing about the man of God is that he is, you know, it used to be said this, people can make a deal by shaking hands. Somebody said, your word is your bond. Your word is your bond. Well, I didn't true anymore. Man, you got to get that contract signed and triple it. You got to get half the money up front. You got to do this, that, or the other. Somebody was telling me today about somebody. Somebody came and said, uh, I need some boards. I want you to give them to me, and I'll bring you the money later. He said, oh, no, no, I don't think so. Jonathan said to David, go in peace. For as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord be between me and thee, between my seed and thy seed forever. And he rose and departed. And Jonathan went into the city. Now, in a few short chapters, we'll read about the death of Jonathan. But that's a friend. That's a friend. Thick or thin, up, down, in, and out, black, white. That is a friend. A friend loveth at all times. Father, we thank you again. Lord, here's another account in the life of David, the molding of the man of God. Father, we pray, we ask, Lord, help us to be friends to our friends. Help us to be friends to our friends, we pray. Lord, again, I thank you for this evening. Lord, bless our prayer time, we ask. Give us, uh, we pray, Lord, those things that we desire. Lord, you said to David, I would have given you the heathen if you'd have just asked. Lord, help us to ask, to seek and to knock. For everyone that asketh, receive it. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, bless, we pray now. And our prayer time, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.